All right. Hey, welcome everyone to, yes, hello, Daniel. Um, welcome everyone to UJUG this month. Uh, this, of course, being September 2020. And we have with us this month, Nate Shuda. Happy to have him here. Um, I think it's been a while. Uh, actually, if he's been here with us at all, uh, he's done a lot of uh, no fluff stuff and a bunch of other things as well. But very happy to have him with us this month. So I am going to go over the typical spiel real quick if it decides to share the screen. Uh, that one. Yeah, here we go. Alrighty. Uh, again, we would like to thank our sponsors the, that are here. We've got uh, Tech, ShareWorks, Goldman at our diamond level, at the platinum level. That includes Lucid Software, STG, SoFi, Fidelity, Master Control, JFrog, and then at our silver, silver level. Apparently, I didn't warm up my voice enough. enough. We have Guardian Analytics, NeoVest, and Neil. Uh, advisory services and NeoVest is with us uh, tonight. They will be giving a, a, a little spiel uh, before we start. So the upcoming schedule. Next month, we have Edson Yanaga talking about Reactive and Corcus. And then to finish off the year, we have Baruch, who is from JFrog, who will be talking about DevOps patterns and anti-patterns for continuous software updates. And that, uh, that will finish off our year for us. That'll finish off 2020 for us, and we'll get back to things in 2021. Uh, door prizes. So those, those that happen to be new uh, on the registration, there should have been a, a, a tick box to say whether or not you wanted to be on the door prize. Hopefully that was there. What we are raffling off tonight are two JetBrains licenses uh, for any, any of the IDEs that they have, and a one-year subscription from Vencat. For the Agile Learner, that is his website that includes videos and other content that he creates for you to peruse and enjoy. And then, of course, uh, Kate from Tech is also going to be giving out some cookies. So whoever wins the cookies, I'll get you in touch with Kate, and you two can figure out how to <laughs> how to ship the cookies or pick them up in person or whatever whatever it may be. So there is that. And I believe that should get us going. Looks like my YouTube stream is not going, so I'm going to have to fix that. Uh, we have a question already. Um, looks like we have uh, the Mountain Data and Dev Virtual Conference is going on. That, uh, that reminds me, there is also a uh, conference, jconf, uh, jconf.dev is free. Uh, coming up this year. If you want to take a look at that, you can go check that out as well. So I believe without any further ado, we will kick things over to Jonathan for his uh, his talk from NeoVest. All right, Jonathan, you're live. All right, great. Uh, nice to see everybody. See if I can share my slide here. You said it was, uh... oh, there's the button. See if I can do this with a, with one shot here. It's really just a screen uh, slide. So uh, NeoVest is really glad to sponsor you, Jug. There's lots of great content month after month. Um, a little bit about NeoVest. We, uh, our primary product is a broker neutral trading platform, which sounds kind of boring, but let me give you, give you some of the statistics. And technically it's pretty exciting from the back end point of view. Uh, we, we serve thousands of users across hundreds of brokers and markets worldwide. We have billions with a B dollars of trading value goes to our platform every day. That presents some interesting and exciting challenge, challenges of scale, as you can imagine. For example, just from market data, we, we're designing systems that can handle 3 million with an M, 3 million messages a second. It's kind of cool. Um, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of JP Morgan Chase, so we have a uh, nice backing. We are currently modernizing our architecture. We're migrating from microservices that we're migrating to microservices that run in Kubernetes. And we're hiring. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, we're looking for senior microservices engineers, site reliability engineers. Uh, yeah, if that sounds interesting to you, go to careers.jpmorgan.com, uh, search for Orem, and you'll find us. So uh, we'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, yeah, looking forward to a great presentation this evening. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. 
And then we'll come over here, mute this. And so the uh, how this will end up working tonight, those that have, if you have questions, you can see the ask a question down there in the bottom uh, underneath where, where I am, basically right underneath my, my chin here. Uh, you can ask questions there or you can ask questions in the chat. I will be looking at chat and promoting those to questions. And then uh, as Nate offers up uh, some time that we can we can do some questions, some Q&A, then we, we will handle those. Um, or if there seems to be like a, a lull or whatever, then I'll jump in and, and do questions that way. So I think without any further ado, that should get us going. All right, Nate, you are live, so feel free to take all it away. All right, fantastic. Thank you, and thanks to all of you for joining me here. So I, I believe if my memory serves, I was supposed to come visit you all in person in March. And, you know, then this whole COVID thing happened. So sorry for that, you know, but hey, you know, virtual, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, my name is Nate Chuda. I work for VMware now. I was at Pivotal before the acquisition. And before that, I spent a long time in sort of what you would call sort of enterprise IT in various roles, actually quite a bit in the financial space. Uh, best way to describe me these days is architect as a service. Someone called me that maybe two years ago, and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. It seems to fit. You know, I go places, I talk to people, you know, I'm sort of on call that way. And of course, now I don't go anywhere now. I have to do everything here, staring at my, my blank void of a screen. Uh, the only thing I will say about being called an architect as a service is I did sound the acronym out in my head and realized it may not actually have been intended as a compliment. So I, I, if you're interested in this topic, and I hope you are, since you're hanging out with me, there's a pros variant of this that you can snag from us. Uh, my wife referred to this as a pamphlet when she saw the actual paper version of it. That made me a little, uh, angry is a strong word, but you know, my response was, and how many books have you written, honey? And she didn't like that. And so then when I wrote this one, which came out a month or so ago, she said, oh, is this another one of those pamphlets? To which my son thought that was a delightful comment. And I said, and between the two of you, how many books have you written? And that both seemed to quiet them down just a smidge. Moral of the story, this architecting thing is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be when I was just young developer person. You know, and I realized this, I guess, instinctually, but you realize that once you get into the role that, you know, you're dealing with all these competing agendas and the politics of your organization becomes a much larger role, unfortunately. But you're also front and center in the inevitable evolution of technology. Technology is constantly changing. You know, and I don't think this is a surprise to any of you. You know, I was joking with someone the other day that much as you can count the rings on a tree to see how old it is, you can pretty much figure out how long someone has been in IT by the number of languages and frameworks that they've got on their, their repertoire. Now, I'm okay with that. I think it's actually kind of a feature, not a bug. It's a lot of what keeps this interesting, keeps us playing around with stuff. You know, I like the fact that it always kind of keeps me fresh. There's always fun things to play with. You know, I, I love my job because I basically get to play with technology and go teach it to other people. It's a pretty good gig. Now, the hard part for us is that I don't want to be on a legacy platform. I don't want to be the you know the last company to use X. You know, we always want to try to be ahead of that curve as much as we can. But I have to balance that against the reality that I can't change things every few months just because something new comes out because there will always be something new coming out. And if we're not careful, we end up where one of my students was, she came to me and said my app has four different UI frameworks baked into it. Now, I completely understand how this happens. You know, the first one was a legacy decision that we made two years ago, and it was fine then, but now maybe it's not being maintained at the same level, or it just can't do some of the things we needed to do. And so we bring in another one to fix that problem. Well, somebody looks at that and says, how come you didn't choose the one I like? And so then they get grumpy and they sneak a third one in. And, you know, really someone should stand up at that point and say, no, we have to just keep this to two or less. And then someone's like, well, you know, there are no rules. It's pandemic time. I'm throwing a fourth one in there. And that's when someone does need to literally flip a table because this isn't sustainable. You know, we, we can't work with that. We, we've got to try to keep things into a reasonable set of variables. Now, I totally get this because we as developers, we always want to play with new toys. You know, it's like every day is your birthday. You always get something new to play with. And so we have to be very aware of that, very cognizant of that. And so a huge part of this is how would you say you evaluate new technology? This is a vital skill for any of us to have. You know, and I, again, you do this multiple times in your career. You know, I teach at the University of Minnesota on and off, and one of the courses that I've taught in the graduate program that I graduated from it started as 
an examination of dynamic languages. You know, I kicked it off kind of right when Ruby and Rails was sort of having its ascendancy and we were talking about DSLs. And I thought that was really cool. And, and what I realized after probably the third incarnation of that course is that it, it wasn't so much about dynamic languages, which are interesting. It was really more about technology change and the fact that there's always going to be a new thing to play with. There's always going to be a next thing. And so I realized that this ability to evaluate new technologies is sort of a foundational skill in our line of work. Now, I wish I could tell you what's next. I can give you some ideas on trends. I can give you some ideas on where I think things are going to go, but I don't have no idea what the next big thing will be. I'm very comfortable saying that it's going to be different in some way, shape, or form than what we do now. And there's a pretty good chance five years from now we're going to be using something that hasn't even been invented yet. And this is both really exciting and also kind of terrifying at the same time because we are constantly seemingly throwing away knowledge and picking up new knowledge. Now, I will admit, this is what I've done my whole life, so I don't really know any other way, but I, I kind of suspect other industries do not throw away knowledge at quite the clip we do. I, I could be wrong about that, but I, I do feel like we're somewhat unique in that way. So the first thing we have to be very aware of as senior technologists is just the reality that it's very easy, very tempting to constantly be chasing new things. And again, I don't think this is a particularly brilliant statement. I think this is pretty obvious to most of us once you get into this line of work. Now, I, I didn't fully appreciate this when I first started out. You know, I, I had missed some wave at the beginning of my career, and I felt really bad about that. I'm like, oh, no, that was my one chance to get in on the ground floor. Now, of course, in hindsight, I laugh at how naive I was. You know, now I realize that new technologies, they come along every 10 or 15 minutes like a bus, except in Antwerp, but that's a different story. I can tell you that later. And what I now realize is with experience, you start to hear the echoes of the past and you start to see that technology coming. You're like, oh, no, no, I, I know how this movie ends. I've been there, done that, have the T-shirt. I'm going to let that one go by because that way lays heartache. You can also look and say, oh, well, you know, this didn't work five years ago, but it could work today. You know, think about microservices. That's one of my favorite examples of this. The concept of microservices was available to us for a long time. This is not some shiny new thing in that regard. I mean, you could have had this idea 15 years ago, but just imagine going to your infrastructure folks and saying, okay, so hear me out. I'm going to need like, I don't know, a couple hundred licenses for the app server, the database, a couple hundred, you know, licenses for all the servers and a whole bunch of hardware. And, you know, I'm just going to need to spin up a, a, well, you know, let's be honest, probably five or 600 instances of the app server, uh, you know, their heads would have exploded and they would have said, go away. You don't ever get to talk to us again. You know, now, obviously today, a lot of those constraints are gone. And that's why we're able to do some of these things that even just a short while ago would have been almost heresy. Like you can't possibly do that. Now, it is very tempting for us to constantly be playing around with new things. And I'm always surprised at how many of us in this industry love to be on the bleeding edge. And, and you know, it, this, isn't, this isn't a subtle phrase. You know, the bleeding edge implies you're going to bleed. It's not everything works out wonderfully edge, you know, and, I always like to ask people, in what other parts of your life do you actively seek out the bleeding edge? You know, I had my hip replaced about a year and a half ago. And when I first met with my surgeon, I assure you, if he had said to me, oh, Nate, I'm so glad you're here. Listen, I was just on Twitter and I saw there's this new experimental hip replacement technique. Can I do it to you? I would have backed away and I would have looked for a new surgeon. You know, I literally want the thing you've done thousands of times. You know, and to that point, when I was in for my pre-op appointment, you know, the day before surgery, you know, which I'd never had anything like this before. So I was a little anxious, a little nervous. My surgeon could tell that. And he's like, Nate, don't worry. This is like falling off a log for me. I do this eight to 10 times a day, every day. It's like, ah, okay, good. I want the thing you just like, this is no big deal. Now, obviously, we generally don't deal with life and death, which is good. I've always tried to stay away from sort of health critical uh, programming needs. And so for us, this is more just kind of enjoyable. It's fun. It's interesting. It keeps us you know, young, so to speak. And I will stress, it's a very important part of being in this industry. You have to be able to learn new things. You know, and I think this tweet captures that perfectly. And I could rant for an hour about how frustrated I am with the way we typically hire and the way we typically interview in this industry. The most important thing that you can figure out when you're interviewing someone is, how do you learn new things? 
tell me how you've learned new things. You know, talk to me about a time you had to learn a new framework, a new library, a new language, whatever it is, because there's a guarantee if this is going to be a long term relationship, if you're going to be here for two years, five years, 10 years, there's going to be some learning going on. So help me know how you've done that in your career. To me, that's a huge part of this. One of my colleagues, actually, it was one of the very few trips I got to take this year. We're having a conversation. He was telling me that both of his kids are now in college and they're both studying computer science. I'm like, oh, that's very cool. I said, do they realize that they've signed up for a lifetime of learning? And he just laughed and said, no, not yet. They'll figure that out quickly enough. Now, this doesn't, again, come as too much of a surprise, I think, to anybody who's been in our space long enough. But education doesn't finish. It just goes on and on and on. This is actually a discussion I've had with my now 13-year-old son more times than I care to admit. There's always new stuff to learn. There's always new things to figure out. Now, of course, it's very obvious that our understanding of a topic is in this constant state of evolution. And this Ben Evans thread really does nail this. You know, there's things that you've got a strong opinion on and, you know, there's things you just know what other people's opinions are and there's things where you can have no opinion at all. And of course, things are constantly moving in and out of those categories for us. And, you know, he goes on to talk about the reality that there's things that you're just starting to play with and there's things that you used to be an expert on, but, you know, you've moved on and there's things that you're just, you know, that you know really well and there's things that you're just sort of no longer following. You know, I think about from my own perspective, I did a lot of front end work. I, I probably did front end work for, at least half of my career. I really haven't done any front end work in anger now in five years, maybe a little longer. And so if you were to ask me like, which JavaScript framework should I use? I'd kind of have to shrug. Like, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you the ones that I kind of like, but that's no guarantee that that's going to be a good fit for you. Now, if you would have asked me that 10 years ago, oh, I would have had some opinions. You know, that was in my wheelhouse. Now, fast forward today, I've spent the last almost five, six years pretty much doing cloud related stuff. And so that's kind of more my wheelhouse now, you know, but even within that, it's such a huge space. You know, there's a whole lot of different avenues you can get into just on that topic alone. Now, I have noticed that we developer folk tend to be very opinionated. We often have very, very strong opinions on things. Does anyone want to debate tabs versus spaces with me today? Now, I don't know how many of you watched Silicon Valley when it was was on. Of course, you know, now everything's streaming. So I don't even know what it means to say that, you know, the series is over. You just, people just binge watch, you know, which is good, I guess, considering, you know, some people have apparently found the end of Netflix over the last six months. But I remember the episode very, very clearly where the lead character broke up with this wonderful person because of tabs versus spaces. And I about fell off the couch laughing. This was so funny to me. My wife, who's a business analyst and normally is over my shoulder when I do these during the, the daytime hour, so to speak, she just looked at me. And she's like, I don't I don't get it. And so I attempted to explain it to her. And of course, it got no funnier for her. You know, this is clearly something that, that is just interesting to us. But we do tend to have strong opinions. And sometimes those are formed for maybe not the best reasons. You know, we tend to get clutched onto something and, and we may we don't do a very good job of challenging our own opinions sometimes. Now, the other thing that I've noticed a lot in my career is developers will get very excited about a technology and they'll come to you know me as an architect and be like, oh, Nate, I have to use this on the project. And I'm like, well, why? And they just repeat the name of the thing to me. You know, and I could insert a technology here, but I get in trouble when I do that. So I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna point at anything. I'm not gonna you know, say a shiny thing. You know, like my biz dev guy got mad at me once for doing that. So I won't, I won't pick on anything, but this tweet is a perfect example of this. A lot of great quotes. There's a big difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. But I see this a lot. People get very caught up in insert technology name here, and then they just keep repeating that as if it's some kind of magic mantra. It's not. We got to have good reasons why we're going to use this. Now, I do think some of this is a healthy fear of the old. And I think for a lot of us early on in your career, you know, someone kind of takes you under their wing and sort of gives you that advice and says, hey, don't have a legacy skill set. Make sure that if you want or need to get a different job, you know, you're good. Your skills are going to help you do that. Now, I, I do have an interesting experience that sort of tells me maybe that's not always the best way to go. I, I worked with this guy pretty much right out of, the, out of school. And he had the retirement countdown screensaver going. And it was like a four-digit number when I first started working with him. But unsurprisingly, when that thing hit zero, like a day later, we had his going away party. Well, fast forward six months, I bump into him in the building. And I'm like... Dick, what, what are you doing here today? Did you come in to have lunch with somebody? Like, what's going on? And he said, oh, Nate, it's the darndest thing. 
I'm working three days a week and they're paying me more than when I was a full-time guy. You know, my thought was, well, gee, that's, that's great, Jackass. How do I get that gig? I want that gig. You know, and, and he had a very legacy heritage skill set. You know, he knew Telon and JCL and COBOL and TB2 and IMS. You know, he knew where all the skeletons were buried because he put most of them in the code base. And he took that legacy skill set and actually turned it into a pretty nice contract. You know, now the trick there is you got to know when to jump. I'll, I'll never forget being involved in this merger at one point where the, the company we were merging with had some ancient, ancient stuff. And my team had to try to maintain this thing, had to try to get it running, you know, as a new unit, unit, unique comp company, right? You know, unified company. And this thing was so esoteric that there were like nine people in the country that knew anything about it. So we had to pay this guy a ridiculous hourly rate to work on it. And project one post, everything has to be unified, you know, uh, profit and loss sheet by this date was rip that thing out because we did not want to be beholden basically to one individual who was going to, you know, charge us seemingly thousands and thousands of dollars a week. Now, I think part of this is just the nature of having some experience. And I, I do love this tweet. I'm wary of new technology and frameworks. I'm the grumpy fellow in the back who says, isn't this just like something we've done before? And he's absolutely right. I think this is part of what we get with experience is the ability to say, ah, this is like this thing we used to do, only we called it something different before. And maybe it worked before, maybe it didn't, maybe it'll work now, maybe it won't, but we actually have some experience to kind of bring to that. And I think this is an important part of having been in our industry for more than a few years. You start to see those similarities. Be honest with you, my favorite example is right now is cloud. I mean, what is cloud? It's a giant pile of compute. I slice off what you need and I charge you for what you use. You know, some of you can can kind of hear the echoes of the past there because that sounds an awful lot like the mainframe. You know, here, I'm going to get this big pile of compute. I'm going to slice off just what you need and I'm going to charge you for what you use. Now, obviously, the implementation details here are radically different, but it's kind of the same basic concepts. You know, I think that's part of the, the value of experience. Now, I love this this thread as well, because it talks about the fact that a lot of us just don't like the old. You know, we're always looking for the new and we always think the old is arcane and complex while the new is simple and elegant. And of course, the reality is that, you know, the new is typically unfinished, buggy and unproven, whereas the old is refined and stable and tested. You know, I. The best example I guess I can give you this is if, if I was spinning up a Java project and you came to me and said, Nate, we're not using JUnit. I'd be like, well, really? Why not? It's because JUnit's old. You know, I don't know exactly how old JUnit is, but I'm pretty sure it can legally drink in any any country around the world now. And, uh, you know, maybe you like something else better. Maybe some other tool can do something JUnit can't. That's fine. But to say you're not using JUnit because it's old, that's not a good reason. You know, we have to come up with something better than that. I mean, Java is old then by that particular metric. Now, I have noticed that there's a very typical hype cycle that comes along. And, and my friend and colleague, Kote, put this great tweet out saying, year one, oh, my God, this technology is amazing. Year two, actually, is really hard to use. Year three, you should never use this, especially if you're just trying to run PHP in a database. Ooh, look, something shiny and new. Rinse, repeat. Now, my quibble with Kote, and I have told this, this to him to his face, those labels aren't years. Those labels are probably months, maybe weeks in some cases, maybe. I think the real challenge here for us and what we need to strive to figure out is where should we not use a technology? We're really good at coming up with places to use a technology. And we're very good at making that excuse. But we need some experience to have an idea of where the edges of the map are, where the dragons live. You only get that with, with frankly, trial and error. You've got to play with it and use it. And, you know, there's a lot of great ways you can sort of assist this out, you know, but there's a tool, a language, an IDE, an editor, something in your life that you can't imagine working without. I bet if we had a conversation, though, you could tell me something about it that just rubs you the wrong way. There's some rough edge they still haven't buffed off. You wish they would add this feature. You wish they would fix this thing. You know, I, I spend a surprising amount of my time, you know, with Keynote, and I love Keynote. It can do a lot of really cool things. But to the best of my knowledge, I have yet to figure out how to include slide decks inside slide decks. You know, I'm a software person. 
you know, so my thought is, hey, let's reuse this in other places. And I just want to write it once and include it in other places. So if I have to update it, I don't have to update it everywhere. You know, and, and it just doesn't like that. I found some very weird edge cases in Keynote, to say the least. Now, this is how we learn. And I didn't really appreciate this until I was having a conversation with a fellow parent. You know, my son's 13 and he's doing virtual learning now this semester. But if you've got a kid in school, there's a pretty good chance that you ask them, how was your day? And depending on how old they are, depending on how grumpy they are, you might just get sort of a guttural noise, a grunt, you know, kind of a thing. Maybe you get an answer, fine. You know, but usually, you know, you're trying to have a conversation and, and their kids are usually interested in that. And, and I was frustrated by that. And I was talking to a fellow parent and they said, well, Nate, think about it. We send our kids to school. They spend eight hours a day failing. And that's basically what we're teaching them, right? He's like, hey, you don't know how to do this. And, and it kind of builds up on you. You know, I've had this conversation with Everett, you know, and I realize at some point here, he's going to walk through the door and he's going to hear me talking about him. But if you think about it, you know, when like he was complaining to me about not knowing some math thing or something. And I said, dude, if you knew how to do that, we would just give you something harder. We would just keep pushing until we found out where the edge of your map was. That's what teaching is in a nutshell. So it's important for us to have enough time with the technology to figure out, well, where does it make sense? Where does it not make sense? And, and the best way I can sort of summarize this point is to show you a Calvin Hobbes cartoon. I love Calvin Hobbes. This was just you know, fundamental for me growing up. And my son discovered Calvin probably six years ago or so, which means I have now reread every Calvin like 45 times. You know, in fact, the other night he's like, hey, we should read some Calvin. We haven't done that in a while. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that might stick because I really enjoyed reading Calvin Hobbes to my son. But this is one of my all-time favorites. Dad, how do they know the load limit on bridges? Well, they just drive a bigger and bigger truck over the bridge until it breaks, and then they weigh the last truck and rebuild the bridge. Oh, checks out. This is exactly what we do. Is a NoSQL database a good choice for this project? I have no idea. Let's try and find out. Will our website support 10,000 concurrent users? I have no idea. Can we send th millions of requests through in a second? I have no idea. Let's try it and find out. You know, now I have noticed a very interesting thing in our line of work. And I don't know what's cause and effect here. I don't know if we get into this industry because we should have short attention spans or being in this industry gives us short attention spans, but we're an awful lot like dogs chasing squirrels, you know, just ooh, shiny new thing. And then we tear after that and pretend nothing else has ever existed before this. Now, again, I want to emphasize, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it is what I love about this industry. There's always new things to play with. This learning does keep it sort of invigorating. You know, I had this conversation with a, a dear friend of mine who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, and we were playing golf one day, and he said, you know, Nate, don't you think you're getting to the point in your career where you need to get into management? And I'm like, oh, God, John, no, no, I don't, I don't want to be a manager. He said, well, you know, when I was about your age, you know, I could do my job in my sleep and it was so boring. And then I got into management. It was great because I was a force multiplier and I helped people grow in their career. Just a whole new fresh set of challenges and really reinvigorated me for the second half of my career. And I said, well, John, I think the big difference here is I've never been able to do my job in my sleep because it's never been the same job for more than about a year and a half, two years. It's always something different. There's always new stuff. Now, of course, the challenge for us is we got to get code to production. We got to deliver business value. I can't deliver business value if I'm just constantly doing proof of concepts. That's not going to work. I got to eventually say, yep, this is what we're doing. I'm good with it. Let's roll. I have to commit eventually. I have to develop some expertise. Now, it's important to know that if you're on the bleeding edge, you're going to bleed. That just comes with the territory. You know, and that usually means some things are going to break. You know, I, I do love this tweet. We've all had this wonderful experience. Like, hey, I did an upgrade and everything that worked before is now broken. So now I have to search for workarounds. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. It's also important to know that pioneers are the ones with the arrows in their back. And so one of the hardest things for us is we need to be strategic. We can't just sort of be the technology hummingbird flitting from one thing to another. And so, yeah, we have to avoid dead platforms. You know, I, I very distinctly remember a few years ago doing a user group presentation and someone has kind of did their little, hey, who's looking for work? Who's got jobs? And so the person is like, oh, man, we're really looking. We're having a really hard time, you know, finding anybody. And I said, well, what's your platform? And they proceeded to rattle off a bunch of 15 and 20 year old technologies. And I said, well, I think I might know what your problem is. You know, who wants to go work on that stuff? You know, that's not a lot of fun typically. Now, in the same breath that we don't want to be the last person on the dead platform, 
we can't constantly be changing direction. That's the hard part for us. So again, we have to think strategically about new technologies. And of course, the first thing I always have to say whenever I throw the word strategy out there is hope is not a strategy. This is what a lot of us have tried. Like, I hope this works. The nicest thing I can say about hope is it's what rebellions are built on. So we got that going for us. Now, unfortunately for us, we can't you know, afford that. We have to be deliberate. One of the biggest challenges we face in our industry is the reality that there's a lot of bits out there. Every time you turn around, there's a new language, a new technique, a new approach. And one of the challenges that we face in this line of work is you have to keep up. How? You know, and a lot of this, <clears throat> frankly, depends on your learning style. You know, maybe you read some blogs or books, you follow people on Twitter, you listen to podcasts, you know, you hang out with someone like me here in the evening, you know, go to some conferences. The, the reality is this has to be a habit for us, you know, and, and it's hard. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I don't think there's too many industries that throw away knowledge at quite the clip we do. And I don't think I fully appreciated this when I was just starting out in my career. I was having this conversation with a, my then manager. And I said, you know, Mary, why did you decide to get into management? Why did you stop programming? And she said, Nate, I got tired of having to constantly learn new things. I got tired of being on the technology merry-go-round. And I didn't fully appreciate what she meant by that until I was a few years into my career. I completely understand it now. When I think about the number of things I've discarded, you know, and I haven't been doing that all, I have not been doing this all that long. I can totally understand why she decided, you know what, I'm just going to get into the management side of the shop and not deal with all the, the bits and bobs. Now, the challenge for us is this can't be a willy nilly thing. It's got to be a habit. It's got to be a routine. And so you got to block time out in your calendar. I'm, I'm notorious for doing this. You know, it's not such a big deal now. We, we tend to get left alone in my position. But, you know, in my previous job, I always had blocks on my calendar because if you left time open, people were going to steal it. There was just no getting around it, especially as an architect. You, people were always, you know, trying to get, you know, I was double, triple booked on a regular basis. Now, I'm very much of the opinion Friday afternoon should be a dead zone in your calendar. I think anybody who schedules a meeting with anybody on a Friday afternoon has committed a hostile act. The only thing worse are the people who schedule an afternoon meeting right before a holiday. That's not cool. Now, I will admit I did actually have a team meeting that was Friday afternoon for a while. And when our manager first did that to us, there was a bit of an outcry. And he said, well, you guys are on airplanes all the time anyway. So this figured this is the only time I'd have a, a chance of catching most of you, you know, in one time zone. It's like, okay, all right, that's fair. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe you've got that, that sadistic manager, you know, so maybe it's Tuesday over lunch, maybe it's Thursday morning. I don't know, but you have to make it a routine. You have to block it out, be proactive. Now, I'm a huge fan of morning coffee. This is actually something I make my grad students do. And what we try to do in class, the first 15 to 30 minutes is tell me what's going on in the world. Tell me what's going on in the tech news. You know, and so you take some time with that first cup of coffee, tea, energy drink, water, seltzer, whatever makes you happy. And you peruse the news, whatever that means for you, whether that's, you know, scrolling through Twitter for a bit, whether that's, uh, you know, checking out InfoQ, you know, I, whatever makes you happy. But you do that first thing because otherwise the day gets away from you. I mean, every one of us has had that experience. You know, you're like, oh, good. Today I'm going to get to A, B and C on my priority list. And like contact with the enemy happens and you're sort of, you know, stumbling. I would say stumbling home, but we don't leave our houses typically. So you're stumbling back to your living room and you're like, I don't know what happened to my day, but I didn't get to A, B and C. You know, so it's got to be a habit and it's got to be one of those things you do first thing in the morning. Now, attention is precious. And I, I can't say this, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, very sincere about this. I appreciate the fact that you're giving me some of your attention and I hope you feel like you're getting a good return for that investment. And the important thing to understand is Michael's dead on. It's a resource. It doesn't scale. You can't buy more attention. You can't say like, you know, CF scale attention. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Yeah, I think my favorite quote about attention comes from Seth Godin. He says, it's a bit like real estate. They're not making any more of it. Unlike real estate, though, the value of your attention keeps going up. Now, if you don't think your attention is valuable, then take a step back and ask yourself, why are there several multi-billion dollar corporations that exist to capture and monetize your attention? Or as I like to say, those cat videos will not watch themselves. Most important thing I can tell you is please don't waste your attention. Please. You have to, by definition, be selective. I hate to be the one to admit this to you, but you cannot, in fact, read it all. 
you know, there was a point in time in human history where you could have read everything. You do not live in that point in time in human history. You know, the moral of the story is you're actually going to miss almost everything that gets produced. Sorry, just comes with the territory. Now, I've struggled with this throughout my career. You know, I used to subscribe to a lot of magazines and they'd mostly just sort of pile up on the island in my kitchen and I'd walk by the pile and the pile would fall over and then I'd go through the pile. You know, my wife would kind of give me that look that suggests now is an excellent time to clean up my mess. And a lot of them would end up straight in the recycling bin because it's not valuable anymore. You know, this is from something a few months ago. Eh, it doesn't really matter. It's not It's not timely anymore. And, and I've let almost all of my magazine subscriptions lapse because I just wasn't reading a lot of it. You know, there, there was one magazine in particular. I'm pretty sure I subscribed to it for almost 20 years. And I finally decided I, I'm done with it. You know, I just, I love it. It's a great magazine, great writing, great articles, but I just, I, I wasn't reading it. And so when like the third renewal notice came in, my wife said, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I've got a year's worth right there. So if I haven't gotten to it yet, I think that's a pretty good sign that I'm not going to. Now, what always sort of worried me was, you know, the fear of missing out, you know, the FOMO, like something important is going to happen. I'm not going to know. Here's the reality. If it's a big enough deal, it's going to seep into your consciousness. You will find out about it whether you want to or not. You know, there's there's a decent chance, no matter how you feel about Apple, Apple products, whether you'd never buy anything from Apple, whether your whole house is full of Apple stuff, you're probably aware Apple had a, a little, you know, little shindig this week and they've talked about some new watches and a few other things. You know, we all are probably aware of the fact there's probably new phones coming in the next few weeks-ish, something like that. You know, so if it's a big enough deal, it will bubble up into your consciousness. You know, you, you have to go out of your way to avoid it, to be fair. You know, anybody who's a sports fan knows that. You know, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, DVR, tape, record the game, however you want to phrase it, and I'm going to watch it later. And and then someone, you know, spills the beans about the score. And you're like, no, you know, it's just you've, you've now rend of garments because you've, you've ruined my evening. The challenge for us as technologists is I can't adopt everything. I just can't. Heat death of the universe is going to happen first. So how do I know what makes sense? How do I know where to invest our time? Well, some people say you just have an instinct. Just trust your gut. Your gut will tell you what to do. And so Paul Graham wrote this piece. Paul Graham is a very successful entrepreneur. He's uh, you know, incubated a lot of companies you probably have worked with or heard of. And he's written actually a lot of fairly good stuff. You know, I, I like a lot of what Paul has to say. So he wrote this piece, and I think it's got to be 20-ish years old at this point. And he actually lays out some very good criteria that he uses when he's evaluating a technology. But he's talking about Java. And towards the end, he says, you know what? I have a hunch that Java won't be a very successful language. Now, granted, we sit here in 2020 with haha 2020 hindsight. And I just look at this and I'm like, well, that's absurd. You know, we can have a very interesting debate about where in the top five languages of all time Java lives. But to say it's been anything other than wildly successful would be false. You know, I've built my entire career essentially around Java. There's just no getting around it. You know, I mean, we just did a conference called Spring One that was all about a framework written in Java for Java apps. You know, I guess with Steel Toe, you know, there's a little more, but it's a very successful language to say the least. Now. He did admit, hey, I've never written a line of Java. I've glanced at some books. So it's possible that a hunch might not be the best reason to kick something to the curb. Now, I will say, though, judging covers can be a very useful filter for us. And I'll give you an example from my life. This was a bunch of years ago. Somebody in the senior management ranks decided what we needed more than anything else in the world was this visual drag and drop WYSIWYG BPM tool of some sort or another. And they got the big full on enterprise license. So then it became everybody has to use this to justify the big expense that we put out. Well, one of my colleagues decided this was great. And, and I was a little surprised because one of the things that put me off was our very first like training session. The trainer came in and said, the best thing about our product is you don't need any programmers. And he said that to a room full of programmers. I thought, well, that's that's a great pitch you got there, bud. But uh, despite that, one of my colleagues thought this was a wonderful thing. And, and so we were chatting one day and I said, well, hang on a sec here. How do you do a diff? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do you do a diff? Right now with, with Java code, you make a change, I make a change, we can do a diff and see you know, what I change, what you change. And he's like, oh, well, that's a good question. Well, you know what? I could do a screen print and then I could just do a visual side-by-side -side comparison. I thought, well, that's not great. I said, okay, putting that aside, 
how do you write an automated test for this? And he said, oh, Nate, that's the best part. You don't need to write tests because the guardrails ensure that you can't make any mistakes. I'm like, all right, I'm out. I'm out. This, this is not going to work for me. And I was not terribly surprised when I think it was maybe nine months later, somebody decided we were spending way too much money on this and it finally got the ax. So that was interesting to see, you know, how that all broke down. But, you know, sometimes your hunches actually can be pretty useful. That said, watch out for bias. A lot of times we do tend to get a little, you know, oh, I must do this because, or, oh, I had a bad experience with that. My, my son was asking me about this the other day. We've had these very weird conversations about food we do or don't eat. So my wife just celebrated a birthday last week and her mother made her her traditional birthday dish. And then my wife picked it up and we had it for dinner the next night. And so it's, it's meatballs with gravy and I don't like gravy. So I don't put any gravy on mine. And my son just does not understand why I don't like gravy. And I'm like, I just don't. And they said, man, you don't like pork chops. I'm like, dude, I had a bad experience one night with pork chops, you know? And I said, if you spent the entire night throwing up and you made that association between that experience and that food, you would never touch that food again. So you do have to watch out. Sometimes we get tied into that and it does potentially harm us in the future. We have to think about our community, where are my people at, although we do have to make sure we're not just jumping off the cliff with the other lemmings. I see that a lot, especially with things like serverless and, and stuff like that. We all tend to just fall off that cliff because, well, I read a white paper that company X is doing this, ergo, I need to do this. Well, slow your roll. That might not be the same for you. Am I skating to where the puck was? You know, I see this a lot too. We just like, well, I have to follow along this path. Actually, no, you can skip steps. You know, I, it's not required that you do, you know, A, B, C. Sometimes they just go A to C. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, I'm a huge fan of the technology radar. This is an artifact that comes out of ThoughtWorks two to three times a year. I uh, actually I have to ask Neil how sort of the virtual tab works. They've always avoided that, but didn't have a choice now since travel is pretty much off the charts. But uh, there's always something new and interesting in, in the radar. There's always something that's like, oh, that's cool. Okay, so that's ready for prime time. Oh, that's not quite ready yet. I guess I'll hold off uh, another few months on that one. But i big fan of the radar. There's always something that, that surprises me or pops out whenever I glance at one of these. Now, I, I wish the 20% time had kind of taken off because I do think it's a very valuable thing. It's a great relief valve. Oh, you want to play with, again, insert esoteric technology. Great. Do it on your 20% project. If it works out, cool. We learned a valuable lesson. Oh, it didn't work out. No worries. It didn't harm us. It didn't affect business critical system. I do understand why this is a hard sell. A lot of organizations are strapped for time and resources and the idea of having developers spend one day a week scratching their own itch doesn't, doesn't fly. And so I get why that's kind of fallen out of favor, but maybe we can pitch Innovation Fridays. And it doesn't have to be every Friday. It could be every other Friday. It could be one Friday a month. You know, it could be one Friday a quarter. You know, but giving people a chance to play and to try things out, to experiment, to see does this make sense or not is incredibly valuable. You know, and, and maybe it's just Friday afternoon. I, you know, whatever we can carve out is, is useful and valuable. I'm a huge believer in lunch and learn like things. You know, I think it's one of the best ways to introduce and inject new ideas into an organization. I think this is a huge part about seeing it, being a senior technologist is helping the organization make that change. And, and I just have never found a better way to do it. Now, I've had some people call these chew and spews which just rubs me the wrong way. So let's not call that, call them that. I think lunch and learn is good. Tech talk is good. A friend of mine has a more formalized version of this called architectural briefings. And there's a bit more to it than, than I'll, you know, I'll kind of give you the 10,000 foot view of this. But basically one person does some research and then presents it back to the team. And they traditionally have a set of questions that they want the researcher to go through to kind of help make sure this is done in, in sort of a consistent formal way. And it's also vital to understand that you don't have to be an architect to do this, you know, but we're trying to get everybody on the same page of why should we use this? What do you need to know in order to answer that question? What do we need to know in order to use this thing? Now, we're talking about this beforehand. Presentations don't all need to be, you know, three hour slogs. Short is good. 45 minutes, an hour, you know, is just fine. Even half an hour is fine. This is not the deep dive how to but we'd like to get beyond hello world. 
Now, the hard part here and the challenge is making sure they're participatory events. We want two-way traffic. We want people taking notes. We want people asking good questions, bringing their own experiences to bear. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why? Why not? And by the way, you should be prepared to do one of these in the future. Now, if we get past the briefing filter, we're all like, yeah, there's a there there. This is good. This has this has meat. This is something we can use. Let's roll up our sleeves, get our hands dirty, and actually workshop it. Now, there's a couple things here. One, really important that you do this within the constraints of your environment. Greenfield tends to work. You know, every one of you can get the to-do list to work in a greenfield environment. And, and that's good for learning, but that's not what most of our apps are. You know, the challenge for us is, all right, what happens when this makes contact with our code base? And so I'm a huge fan of sort of forking your repo and making sure that you're doing this within the constraints of your existing environment. I had a student, this is a couple of years ago at a workshop, was telling me that, that they kind of ran into this fork in the road. They needed to change their UI technology. They realized the one they were using was getting pretty long in the tooth. They surveyed the field and they kind of winnowed it down to the three they liked and they went off and did their workshops and came back and, oh, we really like this one. And, and you know, he said they kind of got caught up in the hype around that particular framework. And they're like, this will be super easy. We'll just sprinkle it in. It'll be no problem. Well, I met him six months later and he says, yeah, it's not just working. We can't just sprinkle it in. And I'm convinced if they would have done their proof of concept work inside their own repository, they would have figured that out. Now, they may have made the same choice, but they would have had a better understanding of the actual impact of trying to use that new thing in an existing heritage world. So I'm a big fan of making sure that you're doing that within the constraints of your environment. Now, the other challenge here is you are never going to get enough time. <laughs> you know, you're going to get a couple hours, a couple days, maybe if you're lucky, a week, and that's it. And so you have to make sure that you know what are the architecturally significant things that we need to figure out? What are the use cases I have to prove? You know, I in a perfect world, you'd have unlimited time. Somebody asked me last summer, should I use Angular? Should I use React? I said, well, <laughs> the best way I can answer that for you is you should build the app in Angular. And then build it again in React and throw away the one you don't like. Obviously, no one is going to let you do that. But that's the best way. I mean, that that's the ideal way to figure out which one makes sense. So you're not going to have that luxury. So give yourself you know, the interesting things that you need to prove for your environment, for your constraints. Do a few exercises. Make sure that you're focusing on the how-to and that the setup isn't what's holding you back. Now, if we get through that workshop and we're like, yeah, this is good stuff. I like what we're seeing here. This this has promise. It's time to do a trial inside the organization. And this is where we're looking for a real project that's a good fit to see what happens when the rubber meets the road. Now, this is rarely going to be the bet the company project. We have to be aware of the impacts of failure. What happens if this goes south? You know, and it's important to realize that, you know, the stuff that's brand new, it's around the edges, has, isn't critical yet. We can probably get away with a little more experimentation than this is how we make our money. This is what billions of dollars are flowing through every day. You know, we generally don't experiment with those quite as, as liberally as we would on something that's just out on the proverbial edge. Now, the other challenge for us as senior technologists is as much fun as it is to deal with all the new stuff, we have to think about currency because these bugs that are coming up, these hacks are becoming, you know, front page news. There are things that, that people talk about on the evening news. It actually has an impact on people's careers. I was talking to somebody earlier this year who used to work at Equifax and said that when he was interviewing, the fact that he came from Equifax wasn't an issue, but it was a question that came up in the interviews. And even though his part of the application was fine, had none of the issues, was completely separated from all that, there was still a little bit of, oh, you're at Equifax. Oh, okay, well, you're not going to bring that kind of stuff to us, right? Now, the sad thing is, is even after these big hacks are announced and, and people you know, have consequences, companies still haven't changed what's going on, which I find very strange. Now, every time I turn around, there's the next largest hack ever. And I'm sure at this point, you know, even the Starwood one has been eclipsed. And, you know, the, the reality is whether we like it or not, is most of our data is probably floating around on the dark web, you know, oops. And I've had some people say to me, oh, we're not a target. We're not that interesting. 
they took down this interactive map, unfortunately, but it showed live attacks that were going on at any given moment. And if you needed a pick me up, this was it. You know, this is an awesome, I don't have any espresso. You know, and the reality is the people who are trying to to get into our systems, they're like velociraptors just looking for an unlocked door. Or frankly, a better analogy for me is my cats. I've got two cats, Han and Chewy, and they figured out how to open the cupboard doors. And so we had to re-baby proof our cupboards. And there's one cupboard they can still get in somehow. We haven't quite figured out. I don't know if the, the little latch thing just doesn't quite close right and they still find a way in there when they get bored. One of them, Han, actually figured out how to open a drawer. And we don't have any pulls, so there's nothing like they can get their paw over and kind of yank on. Like I had a cat once who used to open doors, but it was a French door handle, so she could just jump up and hang on it and the door would open. Well, these little, you know, I don't know. I'm surprised they actually haven't invaded. Normally when I'm giving a presentation, they decide to be in, in my, my background. Chewie was actually bothering me before as I was getting set up. He you know, tried to, to snuggle with me and was very unhappy that I you know, have to move my hands around. So the challenge for us is we have to be aware of the fact that people are trying to break into our systems all the time. And so we have to change our approach to enterprise security. And so a former colleague of mine, Justin Smith, wrote this piece, the three R's of enterprise security, rotate, repave, repair. And Justin's whole argument here is you need to move fast to stay safe. You know, that the traditional pour concrete over the infrastructure just doesn't work anymore. A friend of mine really brought this into sharp relief for me. We were talking one day about, about his applications and, in, and he said, oh yeah, we destroy and recreate app instances about every hour because the idea is that if somebody does happen to get in they've only got an hour before that gets blown away how far can you get in an hour you know justin's sort of analogy is you know you got to get to level 98 but you keep you know every time you, you have no way of saving your progress it's really hard to get to the level 98. so what's your patching strategy you know what are you doing about that what version of a thing would you say you're on now, some organizations, I've been part of companies that have a policy that you're going to be on the major version or major version minus one. So you're going to be current or, or one version behind at most. Easy to have a policy. It's harder to measure it. It's harder to enforce it. And that's a cultural issue, which, to be clear, is hard to change. I mean, culture, I could spend an hour of you talking about culture if you were so inclined. The challenge here, though, is if we don't change that culture we're going to be the next largest hack ever. So you have to be very, very aware of that. This is several years ago, I was doing an architectural review for one of my peers. And, you know, I asked a very basic question. I said, hey, what version of that library are you on? And he said, oh, 4.3. I said, well, congratulations. I have to mark you yellow. He said, oh, really? Why? I said, because you're now N minus two on that library. He said, well, when did that happen? I said, oh, about two months ago, they came out with a new version and that bumped this one back. I sent out half a dozen emails about it. You know, did I need to physically come to your project room and tell you that? And apparently the answer to that was yes. But here's the thing, even as the reviewing architect, I couldn't stop the line. I couldn't prevent them from going to production. I could simply mark them yellow. I don't know if they ever changed it. I don't know if they ever upgraded. I don't know if they put it on their project plan to upgrade at some point. That, that wasn't something I had a purview into. So the challenge, of course, when it comes to new technologies is there's always pros and cons. Every technical choice we make involves trade-offs. And so anytime someone comes to you and says, oh, this is amazing, you should be asking what the trade-offs are. Now, this is design. This is architecture in a nutshell. And of course, the hard part is it's very easy for us to say, well, on one hand, you could do this. On the other hand, you could do that. So to paraphrase Harry Truman, please, someone give me a one-handed technologist. So should I use React or Angular? Should I refactor to microservices? Should we be on-prem? Should we be in the public cloud? There's three answers that work for every question in software engineering. There's 42. That's the geek check to see who's well-read. There's another layer of indirection. That's the one I use the most as an architect. But the answer that I have to reach for almost all the time now is this one. It depends. There is no default answer. There's no formula. Yeah, I, my favorite scene, I think, of all time from, from Dead Poet Society is, you know, when they're reading the beginning of the book and you can judge a poem by its you know, importance and by this and the area under the graph. It's like, no, you can't. That's, that's crazy talk. And same with this, like, it depends is the only answer I can give you nine times out of 10. Now, some people get very upset and they're like, oh, you're just doing that to stop the conversation. Not at all. It's the beginning of the conversation. We have some other things to talk about now. We need to figure out what it depends on. Now, of course, in a lot of cases, 
this isn't a binary choice. It, it, it's actually and not or. So we're going to use all of these things. And then the challenge for us is trying to figure out when should we use one of these things over the other? What kind of guidance should I give you to figure out when you should use one or the other? And to me, that's the heart of architecture. How do I balance these opposing forces off of one another? Now, of course, there is no such thing as a perfect technology. Please don't pretend yours is. You need to acknowledge the negatives. And, and one of the favorite ways I like to suss this out of people is to ask them a couple of basic questions. You know, what do you like about it? You know, so you're bringing me this new shiny technology. That's great. What, what makes you excited about it? And, and I, I care about this answer, but I don't really care. I mean, I know you're excited or you wouldn't bring it to me, right? My follow-up question, though, is the one that I'm really going to get a sense of how long you've been playing with it. And that's what don't you like about it? There's got to be something about it that rubs you the wrong way. What is it? Because again, as I mentioned earlier, it, your favorite tool, favorite language, there's something about it you wish you would change. There's something about it like, God, why haven't they fixed this? You know, and so this, by the way, is a great interview question. This work, well, unless they're right out of college, but if you've got somebody who's been in the industry for three years, five years, 10 years, they're an expert on something or they've been working with something for a while, great. So Java. What would you add? Now, before you add that feature, you have to remove something. So what would you do? If I made you the master of Java for a day, what would you do? And that would be an, that's an interesting conversation in my experience. And to sum this up, Kelsey's got a great tweet. He's always got a great tweet. You haven't mastered a tool until you understand when it should not be used. This'll tell me how long you've played with something. If you're just getting started, you're still in the honeymoon phase. Everything's amazing. It's not until you've been with it a while that you're like, oh, man, there's this one little rough edge here. They still haven't fixed that. This API is hard to work with or this error message is useless. You know, there's something that you would change guaranteed. You know, that's the important step. That's when we know we've reached that next level. We're like, OK, I have some more confidence about I'm going to use this in a responsible way. Now, we can certainly use spreadsheets as a way of identifying, you know, how does this stack up to our alternatives? Because there's always alternatives. So you put your options across the top. You put your criteria down the left. You are free to weight your criteria if you want to. Be cautious here. And then you got to think about a scale. A lot of people gravitate towards one through five. The problem I have with one through five is which one's good? Is one good or is five good? You know, it's like a coin flip. And I've seen people change whether one is good or five is good in the in the middle of an evaluation, which just blows my mind. Like part of the document says one is good, and then part of the document says five is good. It just drives you nuts. I prefer Harvey Balls. That's these guys. Not filled in, all the way filled in, somewhere in between. Just another way of saying how closely does this map to the criteria. I have found that to be very, very effective. So for example, I did an evaluation of Angular versus React. This is what I came up with. Now, I want to stress. I could move any one of these a quarter point and I would lose zero sleep. You know, and this is highly subjective. You could take the exact same criteria I did, do the exact same evaluation, come up with a completely different answer. That's totally fine. Part of what makes this frustrating though is you and I might come to different conclusions. That's just the nature of the beast. Now, the interesting thing to me after I did this evaluation, Angular ever so slightly came out ahead. I still personally prefer React. You know, I mean, I don't really have a dog in this fight. React fits my eye a little better, but you know, I'm sure if I spent enough time with Angular, I'd be fine with it. You know, I, I did this proof of concept this is more years ago now that I care to admit. And I just kept struggling because I had such a strong jQuery background that as I was trying to do things in Angular, I just kept falling back on, well, this is how I do it in jQuery. Yeah, but that's not the Angular way. Okay, but it's more confusing than I wanted it to be. <laughs> Again, I'm sure if I spent a year on an Angular project, it'd be fine. But you know, to me, React just fits my eye better. Now, which criteria should you use? I mean, I have some that I use. I mean, I just showed them to you. How do you weight them? Well, that's up to you. You know, now I have seen on more than one occasion someone putting their thumb on the scale that typically backfires because if you have to put your thumb on the scale, why? You know, that usually is an indicator to me that maybe this technology isn't everything it's cracked up to be. Now, one of the most important things that we do as architects, tech leads, senior technologists is talk about the quality attributes on a project. Now, I grew up calling these the non-functional requirements. That's, that's the way I was taught. But I was having this conversation with one of my peers and he kept calling them quality attributes. He said, well, hang on, Mark, you're smarter than me. You've been doing this longer than me. Aren't those non-functional requirements? He says, yes, Nate, those terms are interchangeable. And I said, then why don't you call them non-functional requirements like everybody else does? And he says, well, think about it. You're having a conversation with your customer. 
and you say non-functional. They don't care about that. They want functional stuff. Forget this non-functional stuff. So you talk about quality attributes. I was like, oh, well, yeah, I want high quality. Of course I do. I don't want that low quality software. You know, don't give me that crap. You know, again, some people call these quality goals, constraints, quality of service goals, cross-functional requirements, the architecturally significant requirements. We also refer to them as the illities. Now, obviously, our customers care an awful lot on functionality. They should. It's what they see. We better get that part right. However, we better look beyond that. We can't just stay at the functionality level. We need to think about the quality attributes or the service level objectives, if you prefer. Now, there's a ton of them. Many of them, no, not all, end in illity, though I do enjoy throwing illity on the end of almost any word just to see what happens. Most of us want more maintainable code. I don't think I've ever seen a developer say, I wish this code was harder to maintain. We talk a lot about scalability today, although I do think this tends to be something we throw around with a little too much abandon. Not every application is actually going to be a third of internet traffic. So, you know, let's be realistic about what we need to scale to. I hope it's reliable. I hope it's secure. Probably want to think about deployability. I wish more people thought about simplicity. Boy, we love complexity in this industry. And, and I think part of that is I want to show off how smart I am. Look at the size of my brain pan. It'd be well served if we spend a little more time trying to fake, make this stuff simpler. I care a lot about usability. You know, that's, that's one of my pet issues. I read Design of Everyday Things very early in my career and it changed my life. I've never looked at a door the same way again. You know, I think that should be required reading for anybody that develops software. I care about compatibility, fault tolerance, modularity. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So what quality attributes matter to you? Well, it depends. You know, I don't know. I mean, it depends an awful lot on the kind of software you build. I've spent most of my career writing enterprise web apps. I could always throw more hardware at the problem. You know, I've had a lot of students that were were IoT type developers and very different, you know, sort of world when you deal with embedded software, you know, completely different set of constraints. Of course, the other challenge here is I don't get to turn every knob up to 11. In fact, a lot of these have inverse relationships that by definition, I maximize one, I minimize the other. So security and usability are a perfect example of this. I can make a system secure. I just won't let you log into it and I'll put it in a locked room and I won't connect to the internet. Boom, secure. Not very usable though. The challenge for us is finding the balance. You know, I, I, normally I spend a lot of time on airplanes. And so I've gone through TSA airport security countless times. And I realized that they have an interesting balance to strike because if they truly were going through every nook and cranny of everyone's bag, the lines would go on forever. No one would ever make their flight. You'd need to show up the night before for your flight. It would be insane. You know, and so I don't really worry when a bar of soap get you know or a deodorant gets through or something like i had a friend who traveled with he had this little thing of hand sanitizer that he had attached to his bag for like three years and it never got triggered you know he used to call it his pure colombian hand sanitizer i don't worry about that right because at the end of the day most people don't have malintent when they're getting on an airplane and so if you really truly wanted to make sure no contraband ever got through no one would ever fly it would be far too invasive a process so the challenge here is always finding that balance finding getting those constraints in the right right place now some of these things are really obvious to our customers you know if the system won't support the user load yeah, they're going to figure that out because it's going to come crashing down around them you know these things that are kind of front page proverbial news that you know are starting to have impacts in that c-suite this tends to get their attention you know, these tend to be easier conversation it's a fairly easy thing to convince people of their importance however there's a lot of stuff that's invisible or at least very hard for our customers to see. So maintainability and simplicity are a perfect example of this. Now, one way I can describe this to you, I used to have this car that, you know, I always kind of had in my head, if I took it in for maintenance, it was gonna be like $1,000. If anything below that, I was actually happy, you know, cause then I figured like I'd won, so to speak. And I, I took it in one day for an oil change and some some routine maintenance and, and the, the you know, supervisor guy said, oh, hey, Nate, we got to replace the secondary battery. I'm like, I didn't know it had two batteries. He's like, well, yeah, with all the electronic gizmos, there's a backup battery. And I said, oh, that's cool. Well, how much is that? He's like, actually, the battery's pretty cheap. It's only like 90 bucks. I'm like, oh, that's great. And he said, 
but it takes three hours to put it in because we have to remove your passenger seat to do it. And I'm like, oh, cool. Now, I don't know how much thought they put into the design of that. You know, and frankly, I don't care how much work it is because I'm not the one who has to do it. But I do care about the fact that I had to pay for it. And so maybe I would like it if that wasn't such a hard thing, if it was more maintainable and simpler. But I guarantee that the designer of that car never really thought of that. Although maybe they did. And they're like, if we do this, that's a guaranteed $500 worth of revenue. You know, I don't know. The challenge for us is figuring out how to get decision makers to buy in. How do we influence them? Influence is one of the most underrated, most important things you need to have as you become more senior in your career, especially in the architecture ranks. So outline the benefits. This is why this is a good thing. Try to find common ground. We both agree this could be better. We both agree release weekend has too much drama. Watch out for aggression. It's very easy to get into a passionate conversation, aka a fight. Try not to do that. Put on your listening hat and have a conversation. Now, it's hard to convince people, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with a couple of stories about how we try to change people's minds. But, you know, if you've been in a relationship with another human, you know how hard it is truly to get them to change. I mean, I'm pretty confident my wife and I've had the same fight for the last 20 years. You know, just maybe the words change a little bit, but it's pretty much the same fight. You know, and that's just the nature of the beast. You know, I'm sure we've influenced each other, but at the end of the day, we're still fairly similar to who we were when we first met. There's two basic approaches to getting people to change. There's the hammer. I'm going to order you to do this. And there's the ninja. I'm going to sneak around the side. I'm going to make it your idea. And I'll, I'll use my family in both of these stories to help cement this. And then we'll call it a night here. So years ago, when my son was much younger, the daycare center we took him to had a standing policy. Thou shalt wash your hands before being released into general population. And so we'd get there early in the morning. I would have had no espresso. I'm tired. I look at my then three-year-old son. I'd say, hey, buddy, please go wash your hands. Anybody who has kids knows what comes next. He just look at me and say, no. So I'd say it a little louder in case he couldn't hear me, remind him of our relationship status in case he forgot overnight. Everett, I'm your father. Go wash your hands. He just look at me, cross his little arms and say, no, never. Now, I don't know what to do at this point. You know, my parenting toolbox is pretty light. There's not a lot in there. And so this is when my wife would step in, proving she's way better at this whole parenting thing than I am. And she'd say, hey, buddy, but I can get my hands washed before you. She'd take one step towards the sink. He'd run over, start washing his hands. Ha ha, mommy, I'm going to beat you. Now, the other story also involves my, my lovely wife. So this was, I don't know, maybe six, seven months ago. I can't remember exactly when. She had made vegetarian quesadillas for dinner. And I made a comment saying, wow, you know, I think we just had vegetarian quesadillas, didn't we? And she just looked at me and said, well, you come up with a vegetarian meal then. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, yeah, at least once a week, I make a meal that doesn't have any meat in it. And my son and I, my son is a total meatitarian. You know, if you ask him what kind of pizza he wants, like just give me every meat they have, you know, and if I try to sneak like green peppers on the pizza, he literally picks them off. It doesn't matter how few they are. It doesn't matter how small they are. He picks them off. So for him, for sure, this was like, if you would have asked him, do you want a vegetarian meal? He'd be like, dear God, no. But my wife did the smart thing. She just did it. And I asked her, I said, well, how long have you been doing this? And she said, oh, about a year now. I'm like, oh, <laughs> tells you how observant I am that I didn't notice that you've been doing this. Now, the fascinating aspect of this is she actually has stumbled upon one recipe that my son likes enough that he actually requests it now. So I guess winning, right? So if you have good vegetarian recipes, I'm all ears, always trying to experiment with new things. But it, it is, again, the way my wife influenced us was by using the Ninja. And I think we're healthier for it. I don't know. She did order me to eat kale salads this week because she got kale from our, our local, you know, farmers thing. So, you know, I've, I've had a lot of fiber for better or worse. But anyway, I will go ahead and end there and see if we have any questions. So let me stop the share so I can poke over. Oh, all right. Let's see. Ask a question. What do we got here? Tasty cookies. So we have nothing under ask a question, but uh, okay. <laughs> I, I find that very hard to believe that uh, the, there are no questions here, um, and that that is not a a riff on your uh, your presentation by any means, there, Nate. <laughs> um, Speaking of my cats, there's Han has now decided to join me now that I'm done. Yep. All right, so the, the time is uh, up for questions. Obviously, whomever has questions, feel free to, uh, to ask them here in the chat or put them over there in, uh, in Ask a Question. 
If not, uh, oh, looks like we've got one. Um, Alrighty, so this is coming from Craig, Nate, and he says, as you mentioned a book in your talk, what was the name of the book? Design of Everyday Things by by Don Norman is, I think, anybody who does anything that interacts with humans should read that book. Uh, kudos if you can find the original title, which is uh, Psychology of Everyday Things. There is a new version. Um, I remember actually the our UI class at the U uses it, and uh, I've got the two older versions, but the new version's new and expanded with extra material. I have not read that variant, but I adore Design of Everyday Things. Very good. Uh, this one's coming from Daniel, and he says, you mentioned the technology radar, so this is the uh, the ThoughtWorks radar, yep. and reading in the morning. Other recommendations for reading in the morning besides the tech radar? Yeah, so again, a lot of this is just your own personal interest. So what topics are interesting to you? You know, so I, I used to do this presentation where, where I talked about like leading technical change, like what does that look like? And one of the pitches that I, I always try to get across in those is your passion will guide you. You know, so for example, I just, I'm not a database guy. I have tried. You know, I, I do just enough database work that they don't let me do database work because I screw things up. You know, I, I had a colleague for a number of years who was really good at it and he was awesome at, at coming up with queries and everything else. I mean, he was, he was really strong at it. I was not. I tried once to read like the NoSQL Distilled book and I literally went upstairs and reorganized my sock drawer instead of reading. And that's, that's not a knock on the book in any way, shape or form. It's an excellent book, but I just, just it wasn't for me. So you have to let your passion kind of lead you down that path into what is interesting. And it's key to remember that's going to change and it can change and it should change. And that's totally normal, totally natural. You know, you can be super into something for a month or a year and you're like, oh, okay, now I'm into this now. And that's great. You know, don't let your passion kind of guide you because that's the only thing that's going to sort of break in and, and force you to take the time. Because there's so many things now that are pulling at us. You know, there's tons of great content that you can get on your favorite streaming device. There's Twitter. There's, you know, all these different things that are pulling at you. And so you've got to be able to kind of set that aside. And so it has to be interesting and, and, and for your passion. I tend to scroll through Twitter, which is good and bad. The hard part with Twitter is really curating who you're following and to kind of zero in on the things that you're interested in. You know, the, the other thing that I, I would strongly recommend in that, that sort of case is just realize you cannot be an expert on everything. That's impossible. Like heat death of the universe is going to happen before you can become an expert on, on more than a handful of things. Develop a good, strong network of people who can help you with the gaps in your knowledge. You know, so I, I'm not an expert on Kotlin, but if I have a Kotlin question, I'll, you know, I'll ping Josh or Mark. You know, I'm not an expert on Kafka. But if I have a question on Kafka, I'll talk to Victor and Tim. You know, so take advantage of those people in your network to help fill in the gaps for you, because you just you cannot possibly know all of it, unfortunately. Very good, thank you. Uh, this one's coming from Richard, and he says an economist, uh, Joan Robinson, once said, "The purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by." my economics. Could a similar thing be said about architecture and architects? Yeah. So that's an interesting way of looking at it. You know, we could have, I could ask, you know, however many people we got on this call, I could ask, hey, define architect or architecture. And we'd get at least that many answers, right? There's, there's so many different ways of looking at it. I tend to look at architecture as the, the, the questions that don't have ready answers. You know, so uh, the, the best way I can describe this is by the time something gets to the architect's desk, there is no easy answer or else it already would have been answered. So what do we do about the hard questions? And that obviously is a, is a moving scale. You know, I think Neil likes to refer to it as the things we can't Google. You know, and I, I think that's fairly, fairly true as well. You know, my, my wife made a comment about that earlier today. She said, yeah, I'm just, I wish earlier in my career I'd learned how to Google. And I said, that's how we write code. <laughs> You know, we're like, oh, let me Google this error message, you know, and then copy and paste. You know, you can't do that with architecture. You know, you can't do that with a lot of the architectural questions. Now, I think to your point, what you're really driving at there is we need to have enough technical literacy to know when we're being misled. 
to know when someone is doing smoke and mirrors to sort of know what critical questions to ask and, and how to make those evaluations, knowing that you're going to have incomplete information and you're never going to have enough time. You know, so, so to that extent, I would agree with that definition that, that we need to be able to, you know, make those decisions, you know, and, and realize when someone is, you know, not giving us the full story or is giving us a slanted story. Very good. Uh, hopefully, some some other questions come in uh, while people are typing. Hopefully, um, I'll uh, I'll ask one of my questions, and this one uh, might be a little bit uh, divisive, but uh, you know we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, what uh, what are kind of your views on the architect that no longer does any coding? You know, he just kind of sit back, pontificates on things, <laughs> just kind of gives you know. So I feel like we should be doing this because of you know reasons. I, almost right. kind of like the the PHB and Dilbert. Right. It's, I think it's really hard to do this job without some amount of coding. It's a very different kind of coding. It's not the day in, day out, pull the next car, do the next story kind of coding. It's more proof of concept. Is this the right pattern? How does this work when it makes contact with our environment? You know, now, I mean, I guess at a certain point, you know, that, that, that sort of scale shifts. You know, most of us kind of grow into that architect role as a tech lead, where you're typically the person who gets the hardest problems. And so you're you're knee deep in the code. You've perhaps written much of the code base or, or been involved with a lot of the code base. And then as you get pulled more into that architecture space, you do have to leave some of that behind. You know, there's just no getting around it. It's a different set of problems that we have to deal with. And in some ways, they're a lot harder because I can't Google. There's no error code for me to Google. There's no easy way to say, how do I make, you know, Steve see things my way? You know, how do I get Kathy on board with this decision? You know, so there's, there's a lot more soft skills, you know, that we aren't typically taught in computer science 101 or software engineering, anything like that. And that's hard. You know, I, I think another one of the books hiding behind me somewhere on my bookshelf is how to win friends and influence people. And that's another one of those that I would, I would argue should almost be required reading for, for senior technologists, because you're going to spend a lot of your time influencing other people and getting them, you know, to sort of follow what you're trying to do. Because we rarely have that sort of, I control your review authority. So you're going to do what I say, because I'm your boss. I have to get you to do something and think, and I want you to think it's your idea. That's the best way to get it to happen. You know, I'm not a big fan of ordering people to do things that, that typically backfires, you know, at least in my experience. Uh, very, very good. Uh, in, in the same vein, uh, another book that I found that uh, I, almost indispensable, uh, but it's called uh, Crucial Conversations. It oh, was an yeah. absolutely amazing book. Very, very worth the, uh, the read. I think I, uh, I read that one on a, a plane trip back east. So it was oh, like cool. a, a four hour read. It wasn't bad. Nice. Nice. Um, we've got a question from some user without a username. <laughs> so they say, and uh, you brought this one up. So um, feel free to take this one wherever you want to go with this one. Uh, what is your favorite coding? Not not a coding question, uh, but what is your favorite Calvin and Hobbes comic? Oh, the one I showed you is is, is top notch for me. The you know driving the 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 trucks over your bridge and then weigh the last one. That's that's right up there. One that I've actually used with my son on more than one occasion. There's the one where I can't remember what Calvin does, but his father's response is, you know the average cost of raising a child is $100,000. The question you have to ask yourself is, is that a gift or a loan? And, and so I like throwing that at my kid every so often, and he usually gives me a stink eye when I do that. But, oh, you know, having gone back through Calvin, the, the thing that amazes me is how timeless the comics are. There are two or three that have any relation to a year you know it's like 1986 or something and, and you know that a few of them involve like presidential timings but they don't really get into any of that so you, it could be now it could be four years ago it could be in four years and i'm also really amazed at just how just consistent the humor is you know in the same sort of vein i i showed my son uh, the far side and so we got like the complete far side you know, giant books. And I think we're almost done with those. And that humor tends to be more uneven where it's either super funny or you're like, I don't quite get that one. I can make my kid crack up by just saying bear, bear. And he'll just start laughing, you know, cause that's one of the, the, uh, the far side punchlines. But yeah, I, I adore both of those. Those are just foundational for me. And I'm delighted that my, my son also enjoys those. <laughs> 
They're very good. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any more currently. Maybe we'll get someone come in. Uh, one of my favorite uh, Calvin and Hobbes ones. You know, it's it's interesting to me that a lot of the ones that people end up gravitating towards are the the ones that have to do with Calvin's dad. You know, because he always he always offers um, somewhat timeless, but uh, also interesting <laughs> advice or uh, takes on life. Um, I've always been fond of the uh, the one where Calvin asks where babies come from, right? And Calvin's dad <laughs> says they they come from. Most people get a do it yourself kit from Sears, right? And Calvin goes, I came from Sears, and says, No, you are a blue light oh. special from Kmart, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's good stuff. I mean, oh, love Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> Good times. All right. Um, we'll wait. I don't know. We'll meet, wait a couple more minutes. Um, may, maybe some more will come in. Um, I'm going to do the, the door prize drawing real quick. Um, so I hit the wrong button on that one. Um, so we will mute you, Nate, and right. change the video. And I will do the door prize drawing as soon as it comes up. Of course, this is never as quickly as you, as you think it would be, right? All right, so here we go. Door prize drawing for this month. Our JetBrains licenses are going out to Devin Linberry and David Koning. Uh, uh, we've got your email address. We will send you out a, a code that is good for any of their IDEs. The Agile Learner is going out to Bryce Alexander Turner. And again, I've got your email address. I will shoot that over to you. Uh, and for for these ones, if you don't hear back from us in about a day, then um, get, shoot us a, an email. And that email is board at ujug.org, uh, B-O-A-R-D at ujug, U-J-U-G dot org. And then finally, the cookies from Tech is going out to Alan Day. So congratulations to all of the winners. And we hope things are going well for everyone. Do I don't see any other questions. So I think I think that might actually be it. Um, we'll bring you back, uh, Nate, for a second. Uh, if, if anyone has any final final things, oh, I've got to get back in the frame here. <laughs> there we go. Um, if anyone has any final questions, you know, the clock's ticking. Uh, but uh, definitely, you can you can catch the replay here oh, at this URL. Yeah, yep. Uh, you you can you can find Nate on Twitter. Um, I, again, we're also on YouTube. I'll upload this video. I had technical issues actually restreaming this to YouTube tonight. Go fig. Um, but it's over there on YouTube. We are looking for more subscribers so we can hit that 100 mark and get a vanity URL so it actually looks <laughs> like it's easy to find instead of uh, we hit the, the UID button and there you go, that, that's yours. Uh, so I believe that should do it for us uh, tonight. We look forward to I'll seeing see everyone next month. Uh, again, this, uh, Edson Yanaga is going to be presenting next month and he will be talking about Reactive and Quarkus. Uh, Jonathan just posted the uh, oh, and so did Greg, the YouTube uh, channel over there, so everyone can go take a look at that. Subscribe if you haven't already. And once again, we thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.